Jerome Hughes has been a top performing distributor of rock automation in New York and New Jersey for over three decades, and it's not a surprise why. We engineer the very best value delivery equipment and services in the industry today. Start your journey to smart manufacturing with a connected enterprise from Rockwood Automation and enhance your productivity, safety, security, sustainability, and performance. Good morning, everyone. My name is William Nieves, Industrial Network Engineer and Toronto Hughes. Today, I'm going to be working with you guys with the concept of the physical network 80% rule. I think many of you guys are related with or are familiar with the Pareto principle, the 20, 80 percent. And you can take it in many different ways. Some of our sales guys may take it like this. 80 percent of my headaches are coming for 20 percent of my customers. Now, the question to follow here is, is a principle like this one applicable to the network infrastructure? Let's see. A reality check first. We keep adding new devices to all network infrastructures. And we are just wondering, you think that it may work? Why we keep doing this? Why we keep adding new devices to network that has been there for more than 20 years? Well, one way to explain that is when you analyze how we invest in our networks. And this is a typical way to see investment in network infrastructure. You can see that 60% of the budget is going for software with a life cycle of two to five years. 23% is going to networking, life cycle of this, five years. 10% to operations, longevity of something like this is around five years. And 7%, only 7% of the budget is going to infrastructure. You can understand here everything related with cabling. And what is interesting is that you have up to 20 years expectation about this um, equipment to be out there. And sometimes the customer wants this to stay there forever. Something that we have to keep in mind here is that when you see the ratio between the turnover of equipment versus physical layer, the investment is four to five times over the lifetime of the cable infrastructure. So believe me, pay pays to be uh, forward looking when planning cable and um, with what type of cable you're using. A modest increment in this budget, it will create big repercussions ahead. Why? Let's rotate this pyramid. And now you can see that 7% of infrastructure investment actually holds pretty much everything else in your network. And if, in order to make things even more interesting, IT budgets spend most heavily on software and hardware. That's a fact. With very small percent of the budget going to cabling. Well, research tells that 80% of the network problems we will be related with the 7% investment budget. So here we are, our 80% rule. And this is the main topic of this conversation. And this is pretty much the only point of our agenda. We're going to discuss that issue. 80% of network problems are caused by only 7% of the investment. Now, what is interesting about this um, revelation for many is how we proceed about these network issues. So let me share with you guys. 10 critical mistakes of industrial ethernet. These mistakes are related with this 80% of failures. But remember, 80% of failures in your network are related with 7% of your investment. Percentage could be plus minus, but key idea is still there. Let's see 10 critical mistakes. Number one, using office grade connectors, cables, and network gear. You see this everywhere, any single place that we stop by. It's true that much of the customer and office grade equipment out there will work with industrial internet. It works, but the question is for how long? Non-industrial gear is not ready for vibration, moisture, electrical interference, chemicals, and more that you would find in a factory floor. 
Smart people realize this, but sometimes they use suboptimal gear for a quick fix to get operations back up and running. Since a quick fix are often forgotten, it's best to avoid using non-industrial gear for your industrial internet. You will forget what piece of equipment that you bought from eBay was the one that you used to extend a cable, for instance. That little box in the corner of your panel, you will forget that that exists. A second classic mistake is careless cable routing. Some cable is designed to handle the worst of manufacturing environments. So you can, in some way, have a little, be a little bit looser about the way that you're routing this cable out there. But in some instances, cable has its own limitations and you need to be aware of those limitations with routing it. And this is a classic example of all type of cables inside a panel with no logic, no cable management whatsoever. Now, when you're routing cables without strategy, you are exposed to some different type of challenge. One, aesthetics versus efficiency, and on constructions and future updates. Let's say, for example, um, the routing inside a panel can contribute to network failures, right? For instance, just because a remote I.O. panel appears to have failed, it doesn't mean it's the panel. It could easily be the wiring to the panel, a connection or a bad, or a bad ground somewhere else in the panel itself. Another poor experience with routing is when you expose the cable to harsh conditions and you're not keeping in consideration how you're routing the cable through the factory. So here you can see a pathway top view and then the pathway pattern view. Can you identify the color of the cables in the picture to the left? No, right? Corrosion, if that's, if that's the problem, can cause voltage and current flow degradation, easily interpreted as a system fault. But there is more when you're running cables and you don't have a strategy or you don't understand the environment where the cable is going through. For instance, you can ask, is too close to electromagnetic interference sources like drives? Are there areas where it would be uh, too hot or exposed to harsh chemicals or just plain water close to roofs? The worst part about making this mistake is that the cable would function properly. Oh yeah, it would work until things change just enough to cause a failure. But the time that you realize that you have a problem is way too late. Number three. No labeling your cable installations. User plans has requirements and standards for labeling the piping and conduit, so does cabling. You can see TIA 606-B for that. Now, the issue is not necessarily a safety problem when you don't have labels in your cables. Well, the issue is time and frustration. Knowing which cable goes where can say best amount of time when troubleshooting or upgrading. Number four, five, and six are very, are very close. So I want to comment in about them in um, the next slide. So number four is not testing cables before installing a new line, not testing extended cable parameters, and neglecting fiber inspections and cleaning. I have to tell you this. If 7% of my investment is because I'm taking shortcuts, and I'm avoiding many things that I should be pursuing with cables, then I have to compromise and I have to go back and say, you know what, I'm gonna start working better with my cables. And next, you can see why. So we said for four that no testing cable before installation of a new line. What exactly that means? Well, a quick check of a cable takes only a few seconds. And problems like what? Improperly terminated connector or a cable that is way too long can take hours to troubleshoot, leading to finger points and project delays. Number five, we said no testing extending cable parameters. And this is very interesting because advanced tester can give us measures um, and metrics about issues with the cable that we don't see, but we just witness the consequence of the collateral effect. Let's say, for instance, a proper or advanced tester can give us indications about cross-talk 
And one consequence of cross fault is affecting or how it's affecting the throughput of the network. And remember, the throughput of the network is the relationship that you have between the packet size and latency, the delay that the Kafka package is going back and forth. Another uh, metric that we can get for these advanced testers is resistance and return loss. And when we have an issue or the tester is showing us an issue in that direction, what we know is that we have an indication about poor connectors or connectors that are susceptible to vibration or moisture. In addition, we have also transverse conversion loss that could be an indication of susceptibility to electromagnetic interference. In the graph, you have the classic view of alien crosstalk. And again, if the interference cause or by a pair of wires in one cable inducing noise into other pairs of wires in um, adjacent cables. For number six, we have, and this is a, a, a classic this slide that we see in many presentations, neglecting fiber inspection and cleaning. If your industrial internet installation includes fiber, and we include fibers in our installations. A classic example of this is the backbone cabling that we use with DLR topologies. So if you include fiber, you know that the most common cause of fiber failure is contaminated connector end phases. And in the screen, you see many examples of that. And especially, this is a problem in places where are due dust or there is plenty of dirt. Now, since fiber connections handle more data and are more likely to be critical, failure can be catastrophic. Avoid problems by inspecting and, if it's necessary, cleaning and reinspecting any fiber connections wherever they are connected or reconnected. Number seven, we have uh, um, a situation that is very, very common. And it's more common that um, I would like to see out there. And it's using digital extension cords. What I mean with that? Well, one quick fix that is often attempt for a cable that is not performing properly is to connect it to an unmanaged switch somewhere in the middle of the link and run a cable from there to the end device. And we have a lot of conversation about the use of unmanaged switches. We introduce single point of failures, we introduce open ports, we introduce loop, and all these are um, something that we like to talk when we create a cybersecurity or a security assessment. Now, while these kind of connection, it may work, again, you are in a single point of failure to the network. Now, this is especially problematic if the device is an office or consumer grade product, the classic unmanaged switches that we see in many stores out there. It's worse when connecting to devices like this, these unmanaged switches, because you have to extend the cable a little bit further, or just because you're not quite sure if the cable is um, losses are consistent with the performance that you are expecting. When you connect this cable to an unmanaged switch, you realize that this device will be acting as an invisible agent in your network. There is no network management tool out there that can see it. And any technical attempt to troubleshoot issues with that cable, it will be a total failure. If you don't see it and you have a problem there, how are you going to troubleshoot the problem? Number eight, trusting the link light LED. What I mean with that, connecting a cable to a device and seeing the link LED, there is a light in your device that is called link or is related with the connection that you do in Ethernet. With that light is on, you're happy. You said, my system is working, I'm online. But there is no warranty of that. There is no warranty that the communication link is working properly or even at all. The link light will typically come on whenever the communications are solid or barely working, which means very little margin for error. Most experienced network engineers can tell you, I can tell you stories where the light came on when the link didn't work at all. And even worse, when it was not even connected. Typical issue of grounding. That's why 
you, everyone working with networks should not trust in these lights, neither should you. Now for number nine, this is the classic try and error or let's play by luck, performing swap till you drop troubleshooting. What I mean with that? When your industrial internet network stops working, that's a problem. But it looks good and feels good to start fixing things. I'm plugging and plugging things, trying different switch ports, root a new cable, replace a controller. You're working, you're executing, but you know you don't know where you're going. Unfortunately, this scattered short approach has multiple problems. First, you could waste a lot of time fixing things that are not broken. Second, it could be costly to replace things that aren't broken, as I said before. Third, and worse at all, actually, since you don't know what the problem was, when your communication starts working again, you cannot be sure that you have really solved the issue or if it will be back again to ruin your day tomorrow. This is playing with luck. And we always um, try to be sure that there is consistency in the way that we're delivering a service and we we're fixing something. And in networks, again, it's, it's very common just to start trying things and see what happens. And I can tell you something about luck. The only sure thing about luck is that it will change. Number 10, being unprepared for the leading cause of industrial internet failures. Richard shows, and in this conversation we're making emphasis, that the most common cause of industrial internet failures is cabling and connectors. So you have to be ready for the leading cause of issues in your network. How you can be ready? Well, there are good news. With a relatively small investment, you can be ready to quickly pinpoint and repair all these issues. Having a cable tester, even if it's a basic one, close to you on site will enable you to confirm if you have or not a cable problem. And if you don't have it, you can concentrate in the real problem. Remember, we're talking about 80% of your network issues at this point. Now, it's also important to understand your cables and your connectors. It's, always, it's important to see uh, and to follow how we are creating this bill of materials when we are in a cable and what extra items that cable should have. And it's a typical issue that you see when you're creating bill of materials with fiber. Having termination tools and replacement connectors on hand, extra ones, even cable, will save hours or days compared to purchasing them or hiring an expert to fix the issue. So we talk about 10 specific errors, critical mistakes that we are um, fortunately following in this environment of industrial networks and specifically this 80% that we're trying to tackle. But what kind of solutions we can have, how we can improve, how we can extend that 7%, how we can compromise our budget with an extra uh, money. What are the key essential steps to follow to not only correct this, but to have the infrastructure that I need for 20 years plus, supporting pretty much everything else in my network. So there are many ways to, to see this. The first one is selecting the right cable. And in this presentation, I'm not gonna make emphasis in how to select the right cable. We can try that before, but I can tell you a few things about it. So there are six specific things that you need to look when you're selecting a cable. Type of channel, so if it's caliper, it's fiber, single mode, multi-mode, the cable type, shielded twisted pair and shielded twisted pair, the environmental where the cable will be, including the electromagnetic interference, the pair count, the structure of the cable inside, and the specific mechanical attributes. For instance, if it's a high flexible cable that you have to use. Again, I'm gonna concentrate in how to select the cable, except for the two center ones options here, because in some ways related with one of the errors that we mentioned before. Selecting the right cable doesn't need to compromise with your budget. And as we discussed before, there are 10 critical mistakes that can be avoided when we do our homework from the beginning. Now, what are the considerations to select the right cable? 
So you think in six different ways. First, the type of channel where the cable is going to be used. That means type of cable itself, copper or fiber. The cable type, shielded twisted pair, unshielded twisted pair. Environmental conditions, including electromagnetic interference. The pair count, the structure, the structure of the cable inside. And very specific mechanical attributes. Now, any category 5 or higher cable will support the 10 100 base T traffic. However, category 5 cabling will not necessarily provide the level of performance needed or survive long term in a harsh, high noise industrial environment. I don't want to talk in detail about every single um, way to select the cable, except for two that is related with the environmental condition of the cable, because in some way match what we discussed before. So MICE is a method of categorizing the environment. The three classification follow this, level one, two, and three. One for the office space, level two for light industrial, and level three for industrial. Now, this is telling us the severity of the environment. One, low lift severity, three, high severity. Now, some examples of these pillars that make mice are, for the mechanical, shock, vibration, crush, impact. For ingress, liquid particles. For chemical and kinetic, temperature, humidity, contaminants, solar radiation. For electromagnetic, electrostatic discharge, radiated RF, conducted RF, transit, magnetic fields. It's, a, it's critical to choose the right cable for the right environment. We cannot take shortcuts here. Remember, we're not spending that much money after all in infrastructure, but we're supporting pretty much everything, the hardware and the software. But there is more. A harsh, high noise industrial environment means also effective measures about grounding and bonding. In every industrial network, the telecommunication grounding and bonding network should always be isolated from the electrical grounding and bonding network. These two things cannot coexist, cannot be connected. It should also be properly engineered and designed just like the rest of the network. They can coexist in your factory floor, but that doesn't mean that can be the same. You, you have to separate, you have to isolate both type of networks. And if we're talking about cable installation, there is a critical aspect of that network and cable installation in our factory floor, and that is about pathways. Pathway is the physical route that the cable will take from getting from point A to point B, typically connecting the telecommunications room to the work area outlet. The pathway may be electrical conduit, j hooks, cable strays, surface raceway, or a combination of both. We are making an investment in our network, and this investment is to protect expensive equipment. Networking is not about just connecting devices. It's about connecting devices with people, people with ideas and people with opportunities. The way to support our infrastructure is start with an investment. And as we have been discussed before, it's an investment that is gonna stay there 20 years plus or forever. And it's just one fraction of the total investment that you're doing in your network infrastructure. Cabling is essential. Connecting devices is essential. So let's do the homework in the right way. There are multiple benefits about the infrastructure investment. We can say, for instance, enhance network security, space optimization, noise mitigations, but the critical benefit is that we're going to be achieving our business goal because the network is ready for the updates, for the eventual troubleshooting after a failure. Now, smart manufacturing is the gateway to digital transformation. Smart manufacturing will rely in that 7% investment that you're making. Connected to smart devices, open new windows of visibility into processes. Data and analytics enable better and, 
faster decision making. Seamlessly, connectivity spurs new collaboration. The connected enterprise make all this possible. It converge plant level and enterprise network and securely concept people, processes, and technologies. We start our conversation about how we are adding new devices into networks today. As the number of smart connected devices implemented on the factory floor increases, so does the likelihood of failure. This is especially true for companies that have more established manufacturing processes. We're adding more devices to our network, so we have to respond properly to the update that the network will need. And recall where we start, nearly 80% of all network issues on the plant floor originate from problems with physical layer connectivity, which is typically just 7% of the infrastructure budget. A goal for the convergent plant internet architecture is to deploy a secure and reliable industrial network to connect each machine operation to the manufacturing execution system, to gather data for the main production key performance indicators. A dedicated, hardened, and secure network will show the value of the industrial network, and it will allow improvements in network uptime and production equipment availability. I will open for Q and A's, but remember, please, you can reach us at turtleandhues.com. My email, william.nevesandturtle.com. Expecting your feedback, and thank you very much for your attention today.